He used yeah. to be, he's not anymore. Is it going to conflict in December too? You know? Okay, yeah. Good check. Okay, I'll let Yvonne know. We're going to bump back up after just a state. Okay. I think it would be my, my, my Friday was 11. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome all the members and guests. We're going to go ahead and get started for October 19th, Commission of Improving the Status of Children in Indiana. And since we only have nine members currently, we're going to start at number three, Strategic Priority Juvenile Justice and Cross System Youth with Justice Steve David if you would like to come up and do your presentation. Can you not hear me? <laughs> okay. Being waylaid by somebody from Wayne County. <laughs> hey, good morning, everybody. I apologize for the mask, but an abundance of caution. My wife and I had the distinct privilege of with the Navy's permission, taking a once in a lifetime trip to Israel, Greece, Turkey, and opted for a three day cruise uh, that was wonderful to the Greek islands, uh, except that it was a, a, a COVID incubator. So, uh, so I'm negative now and all is good, but uh, eagerly awaiting our next adventure, which is January 2nd. So if I Never see you all again. Uh, that means I failed to summit Mount Kilimanjaro and uh, my wife chose not to bring the body back to the United States. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes, but <laughs> yes, yes. Got, got that, that $5,000 uh, policy. So I, I uh, wanted to come uh, with, at your invitation, thank you. I'm honored to chair the Youth Justice Oversight Committee and just wanted to report uh, Julie's been keeping everybody advised, uh, obviously, as to what's going on. And some of you are, are heavily involved in that undertaking. But we have uh, seven work groups. Uh, when you add the uh, youth and uh, families contribution, we're creating that, uh, not a work group, but an advisory group so that our efforts from the individual work groups the recommendations consistent with the requirements of 1359, uh, we'll have the ability of, of engaging youth that have been in the system and families to get their perspective and add that unique perspective. We've got over 20 people on the committee. And when you take into consideration the uh, work groups, we have well over a hundred individuals uh, gainfully employed voluntarily to, to move Indiana forward as it relates to uh, taking care of its children. Uh, we are meeting. Uh, this is a work in progress. 
I'll give you a little uh, inside information, uh, what will be in that report. Uh, no surprise, this will be a continuation. Uh, we hope to, for you, for the legislature, for the courts, to validate some things that Indiana is doing very well, to identify areas that Indiana can do better, uh, and to lay out some groundwork, some recommendations for consideration uh, by the legislature, by this body, and certainly by the courts. Uh, we're, we're very excited about the work being done. It is to a great extent, and I've heard this used, and I think it's great. We are piecing together a puzzle, and at times we're pretty confident about the borders, and at times we're a little shaky about uh, some of the interior pictures, but it's coming together. And we have the best people uh, working on this. And uh, we are quite confident that we are gonna give uh, a report that's gonna be much more than anyone could have ever expected. Um, we have our minutes uh, uh, that are available. Uh, if any of you would like to attend any of the work group meetings, if you'd like to sit in most of those, uh, we can send you a, a separate Zoom invitation if you'd like to see that. If you're not getting the minutes or you'd like to see the minutes, I could give you get those to you. Uh, Julie and Leslie Dunn uh, formed the executive uh, team together with myself. Um, but I just wanted to come and, and tell you, I appreciate the opportunity. Not exactly sure how I got involved in this. I think Justin Forker may have had something to do with it, but but I I, uh, I ran for circuit court judge in 1995 because I wanted to have all of the juvenile jurisdiction in Boone County because I wanted to try to make a difference in the lives of some of the children in the state of Indiana. And quite frankly, in many respects, much has changed in my life but in that respect, nothing has changed. So this is truly uh, God's work that, that you were involved in and we are involved in. And, and we intend to continue to make Indiana very proud. And there's a lot more that can be done and will be done. We are doubling down on the successes of JDAI and those processes. We are doubling down on the significant investment uh, we have made in Indiana thus far with our families and children. Um, I think you have access to who is on the committee itself. So you know the caliber of individuals and the work groups are composed of extremely talented people. So I, I'm just happy to be a small part of this. Be happy to answer any questions you might have, but I, I just welcome the opportunity to come and say hello to you. And we hope to make you proud. That's our goal. Does anyone have any questions? Sure. Of all the topics that you all are tackling in this work, and I know there are several sub work groups, are there any that stick out to you as a particular challenge um, in terms of, of changing practices or needing to change practices? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I don't, all, <laughs> but particularly, I mean, one of the challenges we have is, is, is sort of um, the grants work group and the short timeline and, 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 and the suggestions on, on what's, what's a good formula, what's a good mechanism, how do we, how do we uh, engage what we're doing well, how can we tweak that? Uh, so that the process is as easy as possible. It's as robust as is necessary, but it doesn't, on the other hand, scare anybody. And we have counties that we don't exactly know all the good work that be, that's being done in those counties. How do we lift that up, replicate that, uh, so that it can become a best practice? We have counties that for whatever reason have been reluctant to engage in either JDAI in that reform, or it's been a situation where, gosh, we don't think we have a tremendous problem, or gosh, this is the way we've done it for years. 
and how do we engage them in a way that they feel included. Uh, this is not a top down, right? So, so that's the challenge. Uh, hi, I'm from Indianapolis, I'm here to help you. That never goes over very well. So it's, we're in this together. So what do you need from us? Here are some suggestions for you. So I think the grants and that, and that is certainly diversion uh, is, 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 is a challenge of an opportunity. Data, uh, at least we're using the word data in Indiana, uh, but we still don't have good data. The best data we have is the JDAI data. Uh, I think we've changed the culture in Indiana to a great extent that we're no longer afraid of data. You know, our legislators need data, our courts need data, not to be afraid of the data. You know, Chris and I have had this conversation, Corey and I have had this conversation, what does the data show? And then, and then what do we do with the data, right? Uh, we can't just rely on it, we, would, we need to interpret it, we need to use it, we can't ignore it, we can't abuse it. Uh, and, and just being overwhelmed to a great extent by, by just the size of the deliverables and the short time frame. That people have been working very hard. Uh, here's one, uh, there's several around this table and, and we'll, we'll get our job done. But it's not going to be, here it is, we solved everything. Bless it, legislature. This is this is this is all you need to do. This is an ongoing system, uh, just like we talk about JDAI being an ongoing system of juvenile justice reform. This work will continue and hopefully will improve with each successive year. How best it's implemented, who all's involved, uh, that's another chapter to be written. But I think those are the, the three that I would identify. But all of them are are very important. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Not a question, but just for the, the members' benefit. Justice David mentioned the website. It's in.gov slash youth justice. It's linked to from the courts page, but it is a standalone website. And it has, it looks a lot like the Children's Commission website in structure, probably not surprisingly, but it's got everything you'd want to learn about, about the membership and what they're doing and when their meetings are. So in.gov slash youth justice. Just like your work, thank you, Justin. We wanted to make this as transparent as, as possible. And, and uh, uh, some people want to zoom in and, and are particularly concerned about A or B, and, and some people just want to follow it sort of mildly. Uh, so we have something for everybody. That's, that's, that's our goal. So yeah. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Justin. My pleasure. Have a great uh, meeting. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you. I look forward Thank to the you. Report. Okay, we're going to jump back up to number two to get um, our minutes from the August meeting. Does anyone have any corrections or additions for the August meeting notes? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Okay, then we're going to jump back down to number 3B, Yvonne Moore from DCS, a presentation on update DCS work in the area of commercially sexually exploited children. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. My name is Yvonne Moore. I am the Focus Needs Director for the Indiana Department of Child Services and also sit on a member of the sub CSEC subcommittee. So I just wanted to come and um, provide some information um, in regards to um, the work that we've been doing within the Department of Child Services. I um, was took the position as Focus Needs Director in March 2020 um, and really started to do a lot of work and focus on uh, human trafficking, educating our staff um, and developing um, our more of our protocol and things like that and training. Um, the focus needs, um, I cover, oversee several different things, but the majority of the work is the um, human trafficking. And so I developed our human trafficking, the DCS human trafficking response system, and um, worked to make sure that we could 
provide education and training to our staff so that when they um, have an assessment that we know what, you know, when they go out into the field, they can identify this. So we'll talk about that in the data um, that I was able to obtain from uh, January 2020 until September 30th, 2022. Um, as well as we've been um, working to update our policies, we have um, two new screening tools that we're hoping to be able to roll out beginning of next year um, that we worked with the National Human Track National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance um, to develop, as well as developing trainings that we rolled out last year and we're still rolling out this year um, to all staff. We also were able to develop, um, uh, working on to develop a desk guide for staff as well. So part of the, um, the work that I've done is to implement and develop our human trafficking response system. Um, because I'm only one person, I cover the entire state, it was very important to get um, members of the field um, across the state to get educated and become that subject matter expert in their area. And so currently right now, um, sorry, we have 72 HT regional leads. And so since January, 2020, they have received um, ex ex extended, extensive training um, to become that subject matter expert. They attend meetings with IPATH our statewide task force as well and the regional coalition um, as part of that task force, developing relationships with community partners so that we um, have more of a robust MDT approach to these investigations. So we have representatives from all parts of the Department of Child Services from collaborative care, foster care within the region. We have legal um, that are trained up as well, um, the hotline. Um, so really trying to be educating and getting those people then to be able to help and assist in the field and be um, a subject matter expert and be a consultant um, for their area of the state. Um, when the reports come into the hotline, there is a tool that they use, the SDM tool, um, that also helps to identify the reports. So if a report is called into the hotline and it's identified at the hotline using the tools, then it gets earmarked um, as a human trafficking as well, and it gets sent to myself and Ethan Boring, as well as to the regional leads in that area. So then they are able to have that information, um, talk with the local office staff, um, ensure that you know things are getting identified and that we're able to um, provide the services and be able to identify if there is traf human trafficking. And so the data that I was able to pull in 2020, we had 15 substantiated human trafficking assessments. We had 142 unsubstantiated. In 2021, there was 41 human trafficking assessments substantiated and 283 unsubstantiated. And then the data from this year, from January 1st, 2022, until September 30th, 2022, we have had 37 um, substantiated human trafficking assessments and 227 unsubstantiated assessments. So there has been an increase in our substantiation since 2020, and we're hoping that the more we get education out there and that we're consulting um, on these assessments that, you know, that will increase as well. So when we look at what we've done since then, um, we have provided training since January, 2022. We also partner with ITVA, which is the Indiana Trafficking Victims Assistance Program um, that covers the entire state as well to provide training to more than 1,000 DCS staff. Um, we had a, a two-day human trafficking seminar last year that all staff was invited to be able to attend. We had survivors of human trafficking lived experience experts present at that two-day conference. Um, as well as we've partnered and worked with the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance um, to provide the SOAR for child welfare organizations. It's a specific training that they um, developed for child welfare organizations. And so we were able to participate and complete that program last year as well. We also have been working with the Office of Trafficking Persons, especially to be able to identify foreign-born um, unaccompanied minors that are victims of trafficking that are here in Indiana. Um, and they provided training for us um, in January and March of this year, 2022. Um, and then in May, 2022, we also had a subject matter expert and um, lived, experience, lived experience expert, Nathan Earl, um, provide training on the unidentification of male victims of human trafficking. And we also opened that training up to outside community partners as well. We had over 
560 people attend that training. And so we're still working on um, developing additional training. We also participate in the human traveling statewide conference that was held in conjunction with one of the regional coalition um, under IPATH in Fort Wayne. Um, and that was in August of this year. We had Jane Anderson from Equitas um, come and provide on how to develop and be able to uh, uh, prosecute cases of human trafficking without just relying on the victim's testimony. And so that was widely to my thinking head. Um, 200 and some people in person, and then we also opened it up and it was virtually. So some of the accomplish, accomplishments that we've been able to do besides all the training um, is really working with our CACs to develop um, a more robust MDT multidisciplinary. What's a CAC? I'm sorry, Child Advocacy Centers across the state. Um, to be able to develop that more robust multidisciplinary team approach to human trafficking and investigations um, of human trafficking. Um, and we also have worked with NITEC, um, which is the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center, um, to develop two new screening tools that we're hoping to roll out beginning um, just the middle of next year when our new um, system, computer system, is up and running. We also partner with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and actually Stacy Schultz is here as one of the representatives of the um, Trafficking Recovery Unit. Um, so when we report a youth missing to NICMIC, and if they are at risk or have been a victim of trafficking, we can utilize their services also and be able to assist and identify, prepare for when we are able to locate that child and bring them back into care. Um, and so we've been really working with our partnership with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children as well as well as developing relationships I've been able to develop with U.S. Marshals across the state in the central, southern, and northern districts. They've been instrumental in helping us locate several of our youth that have been missing or run away from care um, and partnering with the Indiana Clearing House for Missing Children and Endangered Adults with Angel Meacham to develop training in conjunction with state police and with our department on how to report children that are missing or run away from care and what law enforcement's um, protocol is and what DCS's protocol is, um, so we can develop that partnership as well. So we've also been able to present training to community partners and stakeholders um, so that community members also are able to identify trafficking. We, I'm also a member of the IPATH core committee. Um, and I'm also on three national um, anti-trafficking committees within the Children's Bureau, the Administration of Children and Families. Um, I also participate in Indiana in an internet crimes against children um, as well. Um, one of the other agencies that is really awesome here in Indianapolis area that's been able to provide services across the state um, is Allies Incorporated. Um, they do a specific um, mentoring program for victims of human trafficking, minor victims of human trafficking. We also have three residential facilities um, here in Indiana now, Bashers Children's Home, Home in Goshen, Indiana, True Harbor and Newcastle, and then the Impact Program at Lutherwood here in Indianapolis that is specific for victims of trafficking. And also um, been partnering with community-based HT provider, SIP 121, who has been able to, um, because of the pandemic, um, they've also been able to continue to provide services um, to our youth virtually across the state because they're here located in Indianapolis as well. But you know we have trafficking across the, um, the state of Indiana. And so some of our areas, um, it's been really uh, awesome to see that Ascent 121 can still help provide those services to those youth in other areas, especially our, our rural areas here in Indiana. Sorry about that. So one of the other things I work to develop is too, is when our youth go missing or run away from care, that puts them, and this is child welfare agencies across the United States, it puts them at a higher risk of the potential of being a victim of human trafficking. And so I developed the flow chart so that our staff is aware of the need to report the children missing to law enforcement and to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children within 24 hours. We are federally mandated to do that. And so I developed that as well as a list of the red flags that all staff across the state have access to. And there's my contact information. I've been with the department for 28 years. I'm very passionate about this issue. 
um, I did my MSW practicum of Catholic Cherries and learned about the disproportionality of our youth in care and high risk of them being a victim and vulnerable to human trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation. And so it's been um, awesome to be able to see the work that we're doing um, and to be able to ensure that we can educate our staff as well as community members and stakeholders um, so that we can um, try to eradicate the problem here. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Does anyone have any questions for her? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, reports that you say that we've found in the 146, is that right? In what year? I'm sorry. We had two in 2020, we had 15 substantiated and 142 unsubstantiated. Okay. And then 2021, we had 41 substantiated and 283 unsubstantiated and 2022 we had 37 substantiated and 227 unsubstantiated it's not like you're working with Indian state police are they the only ones are they working local as well no we have we initially we reach out to the local law enforcement agencies and i know that um, law enforcement are required to have human trafficking training as well um, and if they feel like they are not able to or need assistance um, you know, then we reach out to any state police. Um, there's two detectives that we work with. Um, and then if it crosses state lines and it meets some other requirements, we have FBI agents and Homeland Security agents that we um, partner with as well um, to be able to identify that. I guess what I was trying to get at is not because I'm very ignorant to it, but the process, how, how do they market these traffickers? How do they market these kids? And are we working is it through websites that? Our state police or policemen are using as well. It seems like it should be like an easy find here, but we're trying to figure out what they're marketing. Yeah, the the, the market. And I, I would say Thankfully. that the problem is pretty huge. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's not something that you can just go on one website, you know, and be able to locate them all. But I know law enforcement has different tools that they are using, as well as NICMIC. I mean, they um, have a cyber crimes unit, internet crimes and children also does when they get a cyber tip that there was um potential like child sexual abuse material um, that involved a child on TikTok or one of the other websites, they get notified and then that investigation would go through Internet Crimes Against Children or FBI and then down to the local level. And is it multiple organizations that are doing these kids or is it like the cartel type of thing? It, it's, it, it ranges all across the state and across the United States and sometimes it's individual, sometimes it's a group of people. But the problem really is huge and I you know, trying to educate and even get the message out to parents to, you know, monitor their children's activity on social media or the internet, you know, is something that we're working on as well. So we're working in the schools? Yes, the schools do have, they um, also, educators, teachers have to have human trafficking training as part of the statute um, and utilize, and we have a, um, IPATH developed a curriculum, what would I do? And they present that um, to the school systems um, on the prevention side. Can I ask one follow-up to this? Sure. In the education system, is it training the teachers to look for trafficking or training the teachers to train the children? No, it's training the teachers to identify trafficking. Mm -hmm. So um, not training the children, right. but training the teachers. Training the teachers. And then okay. the what, what I do curriculum is actually for the students. And okay. so they go into the schools and provide that training on the prevention curriculum to students. So okay. they're teaching also. Okay, I'm sorry, Dr. Box, go ahead. No, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Moore. It was very informative. So the state police is involved in making this determination about whether this is substantiated or unsubstantiated sometimes they are yes sometimes it's maybe local law enforcement sometimes it's dcs staff okay um, that is doing the assessments is the 11.03 percent does that compare nationally to what the number of substantiated claims are around the, the united states i'm just wondering if there's a comparison number there to to make sure that we are substantiating ones that are, are that truly need to be substantiated. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I can provide that information at this time. That's fine. Thank, thank you. I didn't know if you could know for sure. Mm -hmm. Senator Brown. First, I just want to say thank you for um, doing this work. I, I can't even imagine um, what, it, what it's like to, to come upon these trafficked children. But um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, why why are there so many unsubstantiated um, claims? I mean, I, that seems to me if, if they may not be substantiated, but something must be going on for them to 
um, appear as well, even it, it may under be consideration. That, and I probably have to look at the data a little bit closer, but it may be that there was also other allegations that might have been child sexual abuse, might have been um, sexual misconduct with a minor that also um, within that assessment. And so it might have been substantiated for another area um, and uh, or abuse or neglect, but it okay, wasn't but specifically we didn't have enough evidence just for trafficking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not to say those were closed out and we didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. It's just that particular category when we pulled the data from our system. Okay, that makes sense. And that, that then begs the next question. You called sexual exploitation versus child trafficking, and then you have missing children versus traffic. What are, what are all the distinctions in those categories? Well, commercial I mean, sexual exploitation meets the definition of child <coughs> sex trafficking, which is under human trafficking. So sometimes people um, use the word commercial sexual exploitation. I'm sorry, slow, slow down, I can't hear. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Sorry. I don't know why we're hearing that. I apologize. Um, sometimes the, the terminology is child sex trafficking, um, commercial sexual exploitation of children, but that also meets the legal um, state and federal definition for human trafficking. Okay. So sometimes the words, Wording is used. So they're all so they're all the same. Yes. And, but that's not the, the case with a missing child, is um, it? the missing and runaway children is part of that um, because also with our federal mandates um, to be able to screen children that miss that are run away or missing from care when they return to make sure that while they were missing or run away, they weren't a victim of trafficking. So it kind of does interchange and fall into so that category. So there's a wide swath of uh, different ways a person can enter into the sexual exploitation yes. or yes. trafficking. Yes, and it's not just kids that are missing runaway. I mean, it could be a child that's still living at home with their parents and we see that, you know, where they're communicating with someone via social media or the internet um, and then, you know, it progresses. So traffic, it doesn't mean they have to go from one state to the next. Correct, there is, does not have to be movement, physical movement of okay. a person. I thought that, I thought it had to be physical movement. No. So, so give an example of it. So a like a parent that puts their child in a, a harmful situation. And it may be that the parent is as well. It's especially the commercial sexual exploitation, what falls under child sex trafficking is when there's something in monetary value, value exchanged in that commercial sex act. And so that would fall under human trafficking. Wow. Well, and then my last question is, it's, uh, so I guess, I guess you just answered it. So sexual trafficking or exploited children don't just occur like in around large events like the super correct Bowl. and that's a lot of the misconceptions the that we're trying to get the message out to the community as well okay wow well thank you for your work you're welcome thank you so much you know, uh, any other questions we appreciate your report on this very difficult topic i know it's hard for me to hear this information i'm sure it's hard for everyone else but thank you so much for the work you do it's very important oh you're very welcome thank you okay mark fairchild I apologize. You told me you needed to go early and I missed it again when we were jumping around in the category, but we, I think we got you. So you've got 30 minutes. Um, covering kids and families, presentation of health insurance for lawful immigrant children. Perfect. All right, it's the turn every time. All right. So I'll actually have a couple items for you today because we do want to update on the last recommendation that was passed through this group. Um, so, but starting off, I'm Mark Fairchild with Covering Kids and Families of Indiana. Um, here today representing from the Child Health and Safety Task Force, uh, the subcommittee that was created a couple of years ago on children's health coverage. So just to give an overview of where we're at now, um, and I'll caution just like everybody else, my data is uh, painted by uh, you know, things going on with COVID, um, but I'm gonna get the best updates we can. Um, so the reason uh, our subcommittee was created is the child uninsured rate had actually started climbing um, in Indiana and across the country um, when it had been years and years of decline on that rate. Um, so we saw a real worry there that something was going in the wrong direction. Um, now we can say in the last couple of years, um, the uninsured rates uh, for children have improved slightly. Um, but a lot of that is due to uh, some of the rules um, that have been suspended during COVID, such as if you're on coverage, it's very difficult to not uh, stay on that coverage once you get enrolled. Um, and that some uh, premiums and things related to other health coverage programs were also suspended. So it was, it was a more affordable option for most families. So it did decrease a little bit, but we're talking a little bit more than half of a percentage point, uh, not a dramatic amount at all. 
Um, so Indiana is still um, shown to have somewhere between 110 and 120,000 uninsured children um, based on those 2021 national trends. So it's still a very sizable amount. Um, and now for the item that we'll be getting to just in a second here, um, I did pull um, some of the uninsured rates for uh, lawfully residing immigrants. Um, and again, these are folks that meet two criteria. They're a resident of the state and they are lawfully residing immigrants. They came through the standard lawful channels of immigration. Um, and I'll have plenty more numbers on who we're talking about there in a bit. But their uninsured rate um, is about 26%, very, very high. For children, it's 17%. So we're still looking at three to four times the national rate for uninsured children. Um, that's a whole lot of kids. Um, we're looking at about one in five, one in six of that total immigrant children population without health care coverage. Um, I'll, I'll go through briefly, but um, hopefully we're all familiar with all these, but some of the implications for children being uninsured, obviously the reduced access to just ongoing care. Um, a big worry specifically with the commission here has been preventative care, all those screenings that take place, ways that we make sure they get help early in life, um, especially when we're looking at those years uh, zero through five referrals to the first steps program. Uh, maybe see some early indicators of autism spectrum disorder. I can say as a previous uh, autism therapist myself, um, getting a kid uh, when they're 70 years old was always very, very sad because I could have done so much more when they were one, two, three years old. Um, so we want to catch those things early um, and go through all those screenings and make sure that they're getting everything they need. It's also opportunities to be talking to the parents though. When a child's seen a pediatrician, most of that dialogue happens with the parent, right? And we're educating them. We're letting them know different risk things that are going on, what to watch for, proper nutrition, other things that are going on for that child's life that they need to be aware of, milestones to watch for if they're not on target. Um, so that's a missed opportunity there. And of course, it's a missed opportunity for the children that are uninsured to also learn some of those healthy habits early on. Because as much as a parent myself, I know I can lecture my kid all day long about healthy habits. Sometimes you need some outside authority figures to boost that along so it can be listened to a little bit better. Um, and of course, we know that when they are insured, um, we flip that around. And when we look at kids that are covered through the Medicaid program, um, outside of just health, we see a decrease in mental health problems, eating disorders, high-risk sexual behavior, smoking and alcohol abuse, um, late onset um, in life of obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, everything else. Because again, those healthy habits have been instilled at an early age. So the coverage subcommittee that uh, has been meeting for the last couple of years, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of some of the things we've talked about. Um, one of the first items that uh, came to our attention that we really wanted to look at is extending postpartum Medicaid coverage. Now, good thing there, right? Because we got that extended at the last General Assembly and over the last several General Assemblies been working on. I know uh, we have Ms. Summers here that did a lot of work on that. So thank you so much. That took it off of our list, but um, it was great to see that one happen because that is huge for making sure uh, that those new moms have the right care and access to care. And also the, those newborn kids have the right access to care as well. Um, another one that has started taking off nationally is looking at extending what's called continuous eligibility for children, which basically means once they're in a coverage program, they stay on it for a certain amount of time. This is about keeping their coverage regular. So when you look at things like the Children's Health Insurance Program, um, that many Hoosier kids might be enrolled in. Um, instead of doing income rechecks um, at a constant variable, maybe we only do a hard check once a year. Um, so if they're on coverage, they stay on it for at least a year. So they can establish a primary care doctor. So they can establish their well child visits and get all of that stuff without it getting interrupted. Um, even if they don't qualify eight months into the year, let's ride out the rest of that year at least and keep it constant because it's really hard to reintroduce yourself to a new physician um, and get reintegrated there. Um, one more that we talked about, um, and this is the one that was passed by this group, elimination of what's known as the CHIP 90-day rule. The Children's Health Insurance Program, um, which is uh, for kids that don't qualify um, under Medicaid and some of the other ones, so it's slightly higher income, um, up to about 250% of the federal poverty level. Um, there's premiums attached to it, there's some cost-sharing mechanisms and other things. But the big thing here is, if a parent were to voluntarily drop their employer-sponsored health coverage, they would have to wait 90 days before they could enroll their kid into the CHIP program. 
Um, and this left a, a, a gap there for children's coverage. And we were concerned about that. We talked about that here and agreed on a recommendation to say, we don't wanna have that gap. Um, and looking into the data, we found a lot of times that gap was actually created because when you have employer-sponsored coverage, um, and if those of us that have been through it before ourselves know that a lot of times the family coverage isn't subsidized nearly as much as just the employee, right? So covering the kid um, and covering the remainder of the family might be several hundred dollars a month, even though covering yourself is only $40 a month. Um, a lot of families get into that, sign up for it, attempt to make it work. It's not affordable. They have to drop it um, based on their family's income level. And now they're left with this 90 day gap before they can be covered. So this group uh, did pass a recommendation for FSSA to look at eliminating that rule. Um, and I talked to uh, Dr. Dan and his crew about this when we were at, it was suspended during the public health emergency. So they have it pending for a package once the public health emergency ends, the federal level. But there is a federal rule that just got introduced a couple of months ago that will be taking effect uh, most likely in November that just knocks that out nationwide. So I said, hey, Dr. Dan, if they're gonna do it for you, let them do it, right? We're okay with that. I know FSSA has a lot of stuff on their plate right now. So either way, that one's going to be removed uh, probably well before the end of the public health emergency. That's why it's in the November rule set package from the feds, they wanna get that in place first, right? Um, so good news on that one and good news that we didn't have to make uh, something else hard for FSSA to do to get that done. Um, we're always happy to do that when we can. Um, do we have any questions on that 90 day rule before I move into the recommendation for the day? Yeah, did you say it's eliminated or is it still in place? It's in place currently, but it's not enforced under the public health emergency in Indiana. Um, and it will be eliminated in a federal rule set that should be passing in November. And if it is not, it's still on FSSA's list to go ahead and do that on, on the state. So we're not talking about the elimination of the Medicaid chip five year waiting. That's well, coming next. That's next. Oh, okay. Right? Well, so that's I'm just sorry. updating on I'm the past sorry. recommendation. I, 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 I'm sorry. We can vote on that one a second time before I just see how much <laughs> we love it. But, um, but now I'll get to the next one that's on our list. Uh, this one we've actually been looking at um, for a couple of years. And this is a very specific rule um, that, frankly, not a lot of people are aware of. Um, so it'll be elimination of the Medicaid and CHIP five year waiting uh, period for lawfully residing immigrant children and pregnant women. Yeah, that's a mouthful. Um, it's a very specific subgroup. Okay, so we're looking here today um, to request um, a recommendation from the commission um, to eliminate that five year waiting period for lawfully residing immigrant children and pregnant women. Now, this waiting period uh, requires that if you are a lawful immigrant, so you come in through um, the legal channels that exist here, um, and you have a lawful immigration status, you have to wait five years. Um, before you can enroll in the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, or Medicaid. Okay, you don't have an option to get in there any sooner than that. And five years is a long time, and we're talking about kids here too. So I just want to put that out there, um, that that's a substantial gap for any kid's life, right? Um, what they have available to them now is, uh, it's called Package E, it's Emergency Medicaid. Um, and it's really only usable for emergency services. Um, it has to be, and it has to be, it's not just a matter of going to the ER, it has to be deemed an emergency level of care or that bill's coming back to the family, right? Or be rid off by the hospital as charity care or something else. Um, but either way, there is some expense that's gonna be incurred there. Um, that does cover pregnancy, but only, only in the, the, the delivery portion of it. So we're not looking at prenatal care or postpartum care, right? So it's very limited and narrow. Um, so anything, and if any services are done at the hospital that aren't directly related to that pregnancy, they're not gonna be covered. So even if they find maybe a secondary condition while that woman is at the hospital, it's not covered. So uh, it really has to be for emergency services, we're talking potentially life-threatening uh, or very limiting to their quality of life, organ failure, heart attack, something like that. Okay. So that's what we have for this group now. Um, we do have another category specific for refugees. And of course, we've had several refugee groups coming into uh, Indiana specifically. We've been a very welcoming state for that. And I'm grateful that we're able to be that. Um, there's, it's more or less a lookalike program to Medicaid that can go for eight months based on uh, the time that they entered the country. So not based on their determination, but based on when they entered the country, eight months of a program that essentially is Medicaid, right? Um, but that does expire after eight months and then they have to meet the qualifications 
or Medicaid or CHIP under some very specific rules, they may be able to get it. But a lot of times they're gonna be in this same five year waiting uh, group, right? Um, so that's a real burden there. Um, and I can say that right now, um, the current status is that only 15 states still have this restriction in place for children and half have gotten rid of it for pregnant women. Um, not that I always like to compare us to other states, but there's been a movement towards this for some time. Um, and frankly, a lot of it is just people don't know this is a gap population that's out there. They don't know about this five-year rule. So as we've seen states become more aware of it, um, we've, we've looked into this a little bit more. All right. So federal permission. There is a very specific permission that was given back in 2009 um, called Section 214 of the Children's Health Insurance uh, Reauthorization Act of 2009. Don't worry, it's my job to memorize these things, not <laughs> yours. Um, but it says that states are allowed to cover lawfully residing immigrant children and pregnant women in Medicaid and CHIP um, and receive federal cost sharing for it. So these aren't going to cost more than any current group. This isn't something where the state's on its own, um, but we're getting traditional reimbursement um, off of that. Um, states can elect for this option by submitting state plan amendments. Um, and that'd be under Medicaid um, only or Medicaid and CHIP. So they have to select, it's either both or just Medicaid. Um, right now we're recommending that we do both um, because of the way these populations flow into both of those groups, it just makes sense. Um, and this can, so this can be applied to, um, again, the groups, pregnant women, uh, children up to age 19 and children's up to age 21. They have to meet all other criteria for Medicaid. This is not creating new eligibility, right? So when we look at say that 19 to 21 group and I'll have numbers on those in a couple of slides, we're not saying suddenly uh, every kid 19 to 21 is eligible for Medicaid if they happen to be an immigrant. We're saying if they meet the criteria, which we're really looking at a lot of times, this might be our foster youth populations um, and other risk groups like that, some disability uh, classifications, right? So they have to qualify under all the normal terms. Um, and same with the other groups. So income qualifications and everything else still comes into play. Um, and obviously I don't need to reiterate for this group, but we prioritize prenatal care, postpartum care, children's health care access. This is nothing new, right? So I'm really just trying to introduce you to a group that we're not all familiar with. And frankly, I wasn't familiar with this rule even three or four years ago, because we always find a new one that, oh, wow, didn't know that one was out there. Disparate impact, um, which of course we always like to talk about here. But it's, it's very fair to say that our new immigrant population um, has a lot of barriers in front of them. Regardless of how well we do as a state, there's language barriers, there's cultural barriers, there's figuring out how our healthcare system works versus other countries. Um, there's a lot of things that are in place there. Um, and then we know that we're still looking at here, these are ones that would qualify for Medicaid. So we're still looking at all those other barriers, low income, transportation limits, maybe you're in an area where you don't have good provider access. Um, even if you're on Medicaid, that access pool is, is more limited than being able to go to any provider you want. Um, so this group has a lot more at risk for them here. Um, and again, gaps in coverage, they miss, especially the kids, they're missing their screenings, they're missing all those world child checks, um, all those early vaccinations they might need for school and things like that. There are some other ways and some forms of charity care that can do some of this, but not in the concentrated way of meeting regularly with your pediatrician and having the family and the parents there as part of that meeting, right? Um, and obviously we're looking at the uh, pregnant women group here too. Um, this is huge for improving that maternal and infant health. This is a very high risk population, um, especially when we get into uh, women's health during pregnancy, right? Because of all those other issues listed above, um, because of all the issues that happen when, when you're in that low income, low social economic status group, um, and then you have all these cultural barriers and differences. Um, reminds me of some of the great work that's going on with the doula program right now that tries to note, you know, culture can be a barrier for folks being comfortable with access to care. Um, and then we added to this, this is a group that doesn't have access to health coverage, right? Very, very high risk group. Okay, so here's our numbers. because I know we've got at least have a couple numbers in the crowd. How many folks are we talking about? Um, so some estimates were run here based on our lawfully uh, residing immigrant population in the state. These are census data numbers. They're not just speculative, um, but they do have some estimated flow in them because it changes year to year who would be the eligible group. So we took that lawful uh, resident status 
um, and we weighted against uh, income levels and who would qualify under that. Um, and here are the numbers to come back on that. Um, so we're looking at no more than uh, 6,000 or so kids under the age of 19 at a cost of $153 per number per month. That's taken straight from our Medicaid contract rates. Um, there's some variability in that when we get to the full budget because it'll depend what category some folks fall into uh, within the different programs, whether they're CHIP or Medicaid, there's some cost variations there. So we're just averaging them. Um, that adult age 19 to 21, and this is that group that has to meet qualifications to still be covered by Medicaid there. So it's not that we're adding an adult coverage group. We're saying the folks that are uh, entitled to some kind of gap there, uh, foster care, um, some of our medical kids, um, some disability groups and things like that, if they fall into that group, we've got around another 600 or so in that group. Um, and then pregnant women, um, so looking at around five to 600 uh, that would need to be covered under that. Um, and that's total cost of pregnancy of about $11,000. And then we can bring in that prenatal and postpartum care. So pregnancy is already covered um, as far as the delivery, the labor and delivery costs for this group, but we're adding uh, mainly that prenatal and postpartum care, um, which has been the big discussion we've been having in the state for a few years is how do we get better at that, right? So that adds that in for this group. Um, so we're not looking at what seems like a massive population when we really go through the numbers and pull it down. But when we count the risk level of this population, um, and I don't want to sound dramatic, but this really is saving lives. It, it flat out is. Um, these pregnant women are at extraordinarily high risk. Um, these kids without getting access to proper care early in life are at extraordinarily high risk. Um, we've got to do something to shore up this gap. Um, that's really, when we talk about this group and we talk about everything that they're facing and going through, these are the exact types of folks we've been talking about for years that we need to make sure have appropriate access to care. So overall cost estimate, um, again, this does fall under the typical cost sharing between the state and the feds. Um, so I've got cost sharing uh, information in your packet there, but it's really gonna be uh, variable to whatever that rate is federally. Um, there's always some reevaluation going on there, but we do get the federal matching on this. Um, so based on the numbers we pulled, the state share is around 3.8 to 5 million annually to cover this group in its entirety. Okay. Now, numbers always sound big. Um, does anybody want to quote our state Medicaid budget? Because it's a lot <laughs> higher than that, right? This is, this is actually a very small number, right? You know that, I know our legislators like, yeah, we got to see after two years, we see that Medicaid budget. This is a very small number comparatively to that. Um, and if they're under the Healthy Indiana plan, that would offset some costs because that's, that's a, a less cost burdens of one. Um, Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, there, again, there's premiums and things attached to that. We're not waiving any of that. So we'd still have that same buy-in feature that they already have there. And we could also be looking at um, some of the uncompensated care costs to providers and hospitals, other ways that the state has to fund these people and other ways, um, since we're covered for emergency care only, that also means a lot of things are gonna to have to elevate to the level of being an emergency before they get treated. Um, and we're talking just about cost. That's never the cost effective way to go, right? And a lot of these things probably uh, caught a lot earlier if they had regular access to care. And we're talking pennies on the dollar when we do that. Preventative care, especially for kids, is minuscule, right? And it's, it's where we wanna be doing it in a way, right? We don't wanna wait till a kid's having an emergency and showing up at the hospital. Nobody wants to see that. So um, that's the, the fiscal that we're looking at there, that 3.8 to 5. Um, I do have a couple of code citations. I'm not gonna read these through because I hate reading code, um, but there's two places in code basically where we want to add them on to um, a list of just ensuring that they are noted as being eligible. Um, in the Children's Health Insurance Program, we'd be adding um, that those 19, um, those uh, less than 19 years of age would be eligible provided that they meet all of the standing criteria for CHIP eligibility um, if they are a lawfully residing in it. Okay. Um, same thing over into Medicaid. Um, there's an exceptions provision there. Um, and if anybody really cares where this all is at in code, it's, it's uh, where a lot of our foster youth and military family exceptions go into. It's in that same area. So this is this is the, the, the proper home for it to go into. I could leave it for LSA if we need to get into codifying things. They, they can uh, be a little bit fancier with the words if they want to, but we're doing the same thing over on the Medicaid side saying um, we're going to add 
uh, both of the groups there that we talked about for the women, um, which yes, would, because we expanded Medicaid um, for that 12 month postpartum, this group would get that 12 months postpartum coverage as well, um, provided that we add them into the list there. Um, and then that up to 21 years of age, uh, again, provided they meet the criteria for being somebody who's between 19 and 21 to qualify for Medicaid, not a new eligibility. Um, so that's the main parts that we have in there. So what we're really looking for is one, we want a recommendation for uh, the Office of Medicaid Policy and Planning um, to go ahead and start looking at drafting up the state plan amendments needed to do this. Um, now, there's other parts here, right? There is a fiscal. I don't know if anybody's really keen on uh, giving FSSA uh, something else they need to look into their budget and find to fund. Um, and again, without getting too political, I know we just passed an allocation and some special funds in the terms of about $45 million um, for care that looks a whole lot like what we're talking about here today, um, right? I think this would be an exceptionally good home if you wanna find a specific place to put some of those funds this writes it for you, right? And it covers some of the most high-risk folks we're gonna be able to talk about. Um, so there's that option of looking at that fund. Um, of course, looking at the agency budget um, or in through, uh, say, what the governor's package is for that funding. Um, for such a small amount, it's mainly that we just wanna make sure it doesn't get lost because this is an easy way to make a very clear and concrete difference with some high-risk uh, populations. Um, so uh, we don't have a legislative sponsor for it at this point. We would love to have a volunteer for that. So I won't corner anybody necessarily today, but if anybody wants to raise their hand, they can go for it. Um, but I think there, that's not my biggest worry with this one because I think this is a pretty clear and concrete thing that's very, very doable. Um, so what we want today is really have that recommendation um, for OMPP to start moving forward on what it would take to do this. And if they want to add that to their budget package for the upcoming budget session, um, or if they want to negotiate that through um, a legislator carrying some of it, then we can go that route as well. But we would like a recommendation from this group to go ahead and say, let's start moving in the direction of removing this five-year rule. Would you adopt the recommendation? Well, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> All third. All, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, wow, I didn't even get a chance to ask for <laughs> questions. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we have a question. Yes, yeah. there, so, there are questions. Those funds for the women that are using these drugs, Will it be, will they only be able to use these funds in like hospitals or can these funds be used for birth and center? Or? Right now, if they got qualified for this, they'd be able to use it for any other place that would be a Medicaid covered place. So they'd still be able to have that and be eligible for that. Um, so yes, any place that would be Medicaid eligible would be eligible to come that. We have one more question. Two more questions. Dale first and then do you have have you had a chance to get with the appropriations chair or ways and means chair at all to discuss or to have any discussion about this we've given a little uh, we've given a heads up on it um but we want to get that firmed in and make that introduction there sooner than later because of course budget writing has started about six months ago already so we want to get involved in that okay. yeah um i thought i saw somewhere in here where it looked like there was an option of doing this either uh, by rulemaking, does, does it have to be done legislatively or is there the potential for uh, OMPP to just um, include this in there? Right. Um, so the way it's written, OMPP could just put in the state plan amendments. They don't need authorization um, for, for a lot of these in that. Um, I did put in a couple of Indiana code citations. It's not in the administrative code, it's in Indiana code. Um, just to make sure it's firmly in code where we have some of a, our other accepted groups. Um, it would be much stronger for FSSA to be able to work with it going forward if we did codify those two elements that I brought forward. Um, but they could start preparing state plan amendments right away. So then, so then my, mm -hmm. my next question is given this current client climate, um, do you foresee a pushback from legislators who look at this as increasing the budget for immigrants who, um, you know, come to the United States just to get health care, you know, uh, all of those kinds of comments. And, and how would you, how would you address that pushback? Right. Um, and, and as much as I don't want to put on my lobbyist hat today, uh, but I, I can say realistically, this is a very specific group of immigrants. These are the ones that came through the legal channels. And these are, it's not all of them. It's the pregnant women and the children, the highest risk among that group. So it's not even covering the entirety of that group. It's taking the two highest risk groups 
within that group um, and going forward with them and providing them with that coverage. Okay, and then my last question is, have you worked with the hospitals to find out just how much, do we still have the disproportionate share and um, to cover these kinds of things or have, have you been able to determine with the hospital, help with the hospitals, just how much this would save them to have coverage for this population that comes to them. Right. When we look at groups like the federally qualified healthcare centers and the hospitals, and we have talked a little bit with the hospital association and some of the other groups there, um, it's either they're getting coverage through the package E Medicaid, which frankly is not a group a lot of immigrants are aware of or know it's there. So what happens more frequently is they're showing up at the hospital or at a, at a healthcare center without that coverage. Um, sometimes it means that they're not going to be able to help them in that families could be left with the bill. Um, but most of the times the hospital, especially if we're talking a pregnancy um, where they're coming in for labor and delivery, um, that's going to be a direct cost to them of that uh, 10 to $20,000 for that delivery. So um, there's ways where we could really look at covering these folks preventatively so they're not showing up at the hospitals and having yeah. uncompensated care and probably comes to close to covering the cost of this package. Really, I'm just thinking that there could be some um, additional uh, ammunition added to your argument by showing just how much it would save the hospitals and the network of hospitals around the state to not have to pick that cost up if mm -hmm. folks appear um, and need their services. Yeah, and I, I think that's very, very true. Because again, anytime I talk prevention, I'm a, a prevention person at heart and always have been. I know prevention always pays for itself. When we do things early, it, it tends to pay for itself just fine. Can I make a comment about that? I think if you would just look at maybe the number of preterm births or babies that are born with complications mm -hmm. and the cost of that, and when they're born, they're automatically Indiana U.S. citizens mm -hmm. and covered by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be savings there that will equal this. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I'm sorry Thank I made you. you a minute late, so go fast. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely Thank you done. For the presentation. Yes. All right. Um, Moving on to number five, evaluating our impact, and that's Sarah Mihich. She's ready to go. Okay. Welcome. She's got a dagger in her hand. Hello. I need to change the battery. Okay. In that. Oh, yeah. It seems like it's working. Okay. <laughs> I'll just hit really hard. Thank <laughs> you. All right, hello. Um, I am Sarah Mihich and I'm with Transform Consulting Group and I am one of the project consultants at Transform Consulting that has been working on the evaluation report with Julie the last couple of months. And I am excited to share with you an update on our evaluation. Um, what I'm going to walk you through today is our evaluation process, some key findings from the evaluation reports, recommendations that we found and what our next steps are. So our evaluation process is a four-step process, and this is what we follow. And so the first step is um, establishing those clear questions and metrics. And in the evaluation report, it was guided through the four key research questions that were identified by the commission in the RFP. The second step is developing uh, data tools and gathering the data. And we at TCG followed a mixed method approach of collecting publicly available data and stakeholder feedback. And then step three is analyze and summarize the data. So in your packet, you should have access to the evaluation report, which summarizes all of the data that we collected and I will be providing a highlight of some of those key findings. Not every single data point will be here forever, but just some of those key highlights. And then our fourth step is to use the data. And at the end of the evaluation report, um, we provided some recommendations to the commission. So let's look at some of the key findings. So the first research question or the first part of it is, is the commission having an impact on the way Indiana state government operates for vulnerable children? So looking at the feedback from the stakeholders, the, the answer to that first question is yes, the commission is having an impact. And these are some of the themes of the impact that the commission is having based off of the feedback that we gathered. We asked current and past commission members to rank areas of success that helped lead the commission to make 
Um, the impact in Indiana and closing data gaps, aligning to existing state efforts and forming a new collaborations were ranked mostly um, at, at the top area of success. And then um, funding evidence-based practices and then making Indiana a better place for its lowest ranked areas of success. This table um, summarizes five bills passed um, due to the commission and task force work. Um, these bills are likely to improve upon the outcomes of Indiana's children and family, um, but it's still too early to gather information to understand the impact of these bills. Stakeholders were asked to provide their level of agreement to the following statement, the commission is making an impact on vulnerable populations. And the first visual um, up top are current commission members, past commission members, task force members, and committee members. And you can see that 65% of those respondents either agreed or strongly agreed um, to that statement. The bottom visual is showing community organizations, and you can see that the majority, 70%, said unsure. Similar question was asked to provide their level of agreement to the statement, the commission practices equity, inclusion, and cultural competence. The top visual shows the current commission members, past commission members, task force <laughs> members, and committee members. And you can see 67% said strongly agreed or agreed to that statement. And then community organizations, once again, almost half said unsure. So looking at the second part of the first research question, is the commission having an impact on the outcomes of vulnerable children served by state systems? So it is very difficult to measure the direct impact on youth and families in Indiana because the commission serves more of the state systems and serves as a more of an intermediary between the children and family. However, we did find some two examples of what that potential impact could be. And so the first one was looking at the youth risk behavior school survey participation rates. As you can see in 2015, Indiana met the participation rate of 60%. So the data was able to be published and usable um, for organizations to make informed decisions. And then in 2017 and 2019, Indiana did not meet that participation rate. But then in 2021, Indiana did meet that participation rate at 71%, so the data was able to be um, published. And this was really due to the commission provided a letter of support um, for the survey signed by the EUD, the health commissioner, and the superintendent of public um, instruction. And then the EUD also participated in the advisory committee to help um, brainstorm ideas to increase the participation rate. And those were just a couple of contributing factors to increase that. Sarah, I just have to, I just have to break in there and say, it's not just because of the commission that no. we got that yes. participation rate. There, there were, those were the ways that we contributed, yes. but it was a huge effort, uh, mainly by Dr. Box and her staff. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. With, with great support from the commission, yeah. though, we appreciate it. It's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. And we're freezing. Okay, here we go. And then um, another, um, area to looking at data and understanding the impact on youth is looking at the recommendations to remove the 90 day waiting period for children to in, be enrolled in CHIP. And we just heard from Mark Fairchild an update on that recommendation and I'm sure um, we can understand what the impact of that could be. So looking at research question number two, what is the reach, role and perception of the commission among entities addressing the needs of vulnerable youth? So less than half of community members and funders are aware of the commission. Um, those unfamiliar with the commission were interested in learning more about its work and ways to increase their involvement. Research question number three, how are the commission's tools, resources, and other work products being employed by family and youth serving professionals and are they effective? So less than 7% of stakeholders indicated, yes, I've used the tools, resources, and projects of the commission. Um, more than almost 50%, 48 said no. 
stakeholders were asked what additional information or tools would be useful for stakeholders work and so these are some of the things that were identified in the open ended comment. Uh, when an operational doc documents and procedures examples were onboarding process for subcommittee chairs an overview of each committee's work, a primer on the Indiana legislative process, and a calendar on the commission's website showing all committee meetings. Uh, stakeholders also indicated they wanted more data. They didn't specify what data. Some did say they wanted more disaggregated data. Looking at research question number four, how can the commission maximize the effectiveness of its work and the use of its resources? So earlier, we saw um, rankings of areas of success that helped lead the commission to make the biggest impact. We then asked them to rank the same categories based on feasibility. And as you can see, two out of the three are the same and one is not. The closing data gap was ranked highly for having the biggest impact, but it was lower on the list of feasibility. Commission members were asked what obstacles or challenges prevent the commission from achieving success. Over 50%, 53% said a very broad vision statement. So from the data and information we gathered for this evaluation report, we recommended that the commission ident identify ways to be more focused and develop strategic goals to understand their overall impact on youth and families in Indiana. And we divided those recommendations into four themes. The first one was awareness. There's been a lot of work that's been done since hiring an EV to the commission to bring in awareness. However, from the stakeholder feedback, there still needs to be more um, awareness of what the commission does and accesses, access to the tools and resources. There's also um, some recommendations related to operational, um, having more structured procedures and processes in place. In the past, there's been previous interns who went through many meeting notes to just to understand what are the actions that the commission has taken. So having some structures some procedures and processes to document the work that's being done can really help improve some of our systems. And then follow through. So there's a lot of data out there and available, but making it accessible and usable for our task force and committees to use it within their work so they can make data informed decisions. And then also ensure that we are revisiting recommendations on a um, consistent basis, just like the, the 90 day waiting period um, and making sure that we're continuing to having that positive outcome for you. And then the last um, set of recommendations are around the theme of equity. There's been a lot of great work around equity. However, we provide some recommendations to continue that great work and to make sure that we continue to stay up to date with best practices and research. So what are our next steps? Uh, we are gonna <laughs> share and use the data. Uh, we're gonna be working with Julie in the next couple of months to uh, prioritize these recommendations and to understand what is doable, short, immediate, and long-term, and then also start to develop a quality improvement process um, moving forward. Uh, here are some contact information. If you wanna reach out to us, Julie also has our information, so you're happy to reach out at any time. Um, those, that's the evaluation report, some key findings. I'm happy to take any questions or feedback from the group. Thank you very much, Sarah, for yeah. all of your work. Does anyone have any questions? This one. This one. Mm -hmm. this one. So does this, I, I think, is this out of your purview, but can this report make recommendations for staffing? I mean, for everything that you've said, needs to occur, is there adequate staff in place to make this even possible? I think that's one of the things that we'll be working through with Julie um, to identify what is plausible in the next months, years. Um, At yeah, the current staffing and if we have more staffing, mm -hmm. what things, other things can we achieve? I think there needs to, that needs to be looked at too. Absolutely, yeah, we'll definitely, we'll be talking about that. Thank you. Great questions. Yeah. Yep. I guess my question is more pointed to Julie. <laughs> yeah. um, have we done these before, this before, anytime? An evaluation? Mm -hmm. No, this is the first time. So what did you feel when you seen the results? How did you take the results? 
Did, it, um, did you have expectations or did you? I mean, it's, there's no big surprises in here to me. It's, it's pretty much what I thought. I mean, I think I'm pleased with, you know, the fact people do think we're making an impact that the biggest impact is in the area of just fostering collaboration, which is what the commission was intended to do, right? Um, to be data informed. So I think a lot of it is tracks with kind of probably what, how I thought it was going. I appreciate having the, the concrete recommendations for how to improve. And um, I'll, I'll be up here in a minute talking about the strategic planning process and how we're gonna take some of this information um, and build it into our next strategic plan. But yeah, no, no big surprises, but, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the work of Transform and, and how they've run it's the whole process. Work. Yeah, it's, it's been good work. And I know Terry Stigman's not, Director Stigman's not here, but I think our goal is to put her out of business, correct? Are we all in agreement <laughs> with that? That would be wonderful. <laughs> Any other questions? I had one, but I think you might answer that when you give your presentation, so I'll let you go. Okay. okay. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so much for all your hard work. Appreciate it very much. And next we have our own Julie Lerman. <laughs> See if this thing works for me. I need to change the batteries in the. Uh oh, can I turn it on? Uh, okay. All right, <laughs> here we go, technology. Okay, so strategic planning is the next step uh, in, in addition to the steps that Sarah mentioned. So part of this whole evaluation plan was to also um, develop a continuous quality improvement process. So in other words, how do we keep sort of collecting data annually and kind of keep checking on our impact? So I'll be working with them on that, but then I'm also looking at how do we take this information and put it into the next strategic plan. So our current strategic plan goes through the end of this year. Um, I have uh, requested input from the current task force co-chairs. So, you know, we have the four areas child health and safety, substance abuse and mental health, juvenile justice and cross system and educational outcomes. Each of those is a task force with two co-chairs. I emailed them all and kind of requested some feedback on the objectives they're working on now. Are there any they think can come out of the plan? Are there any that should change? Are there any new ones that should be added in their areas? Um, so I'm gonna get that, that data back from the task force co-chairs and I would certainly welcome that input from any of you as well on the specific, on the current strategic plan, right? Like, what can go, what should stay, what should change. Um, and then I'm gonna take the data, as I mentioned, from this evaluation process and report. Um, and the plan is to hold a half day um, strategic planning retreat on November 7th. I am looking for volunteers for that <laughs> um, among both uh, the, the um, task force and committee uh, members or, or co-chairs and any of you who would be free on that day. I'm still, I, it's, it should be a half day. I don't know yet if it'll be morning or afternoon. I don't know yet if it'll be in-person or remote. That will depend on kind of who's interested and then we'll kind of do a poll and see what, what people are available, um, what, what time they're available. But the, the goal of that would be to um, really zero in on that theory of change, which you saw a few months ago, also developed by Transform. So that's our kind of logic model. That's our, you know, how do we, um, what are our inputs, what are our strategies and what are the outcomes that we're looking for? So we would go over that, we would go over all this data and then really kind of try to put together our priorities for the new plan. So, that, so that's the goal for that half day on the 7th. Um, the executive committee meets on the 9th. I will mention these two dates, um, sandwich election day. So I know it's gonna be a busy time <laughs> for some of you, um, but uh, I'll report back to the executive committee, you know, just kind of initially what came out of that retreat. Uh, and then I'll work on drafting up a, a plan for you all to look at. Um, I had hoped to be able to, uh, to actually get a strategic plan passed in December, but our, our dates are a little, um, Weird, our December meeting is early this year, it's December 7th, so we're not gonna have enough time to really get it fully vetted and, and passed in December. Um, so we'll take that month of uh, November, beginning of December, I'll get a draft out um, to you all and get your feedback and any changes, revisions um, with the, the executive committee in January, and then we'll have it on the agenda in February. Um, that's that's the, the planned timeline for, for that and that process. Um, any questions on that? Anyone want to volunteer for the seventh? I know I just picked a date. It's just kind of, I'm just kind of trying to fit it in and, and make it happen. Um, so if anybody has a couple hours. 
Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what are you looking well, for volunteers to do? Virtually, you, you, have, have, it on you have it on your calendar. <laughs> to participate in the in the planning retreat on um, November seventh. So to act, to show up, to appear, or to to help with the planning in the back end of it. To participate in a meeting on that day. Oh, okay. a, a couple well, hour I'll, meeting. I'll participate. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Great. I'm, I'm putting it on my calendar right now. Great. But I awesome. just don't, you haven't told me the time. No, no, no. I have to, once I know who all is interested, then I'll do a, I'll do a quick poll to identify the time that day and the, so um, the method. Out the whole day, I don't like just, that. just for a few days. Oh, we'll, we'll get it squared away here really quickly. Okay. okay so Senator Bro, Senator Donato, Stephanie, Dejana. Awesome. Anyone else? Okay. That's a great group. And I do have, I think a couple of the task force co-chairs who are also interested in participating. Um, anyone who's watching and is interested, email me. Um, okay, I'll let you know, but I think I'm good. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments or thoughts on the strategic planning or the evaluation or how those go together? Chris, was your question answered? Yeah, okay. yeah. I was just curious as to like how the recommendations would be carried out, but it kind of sounds like through the strategic plan, you're going to put that in and then that's how. Yeah, be. that that's the idea. So I think this next, our current strategic plan is mostly about sort of the topics we want to address. And I think the next plan, and actually if you've been around since the beginning, which yeah. you have, you're one of the only ones, the very first strategic plan was also accompanied by an operational plan that had some more of those nuts yeah. and bolts things. We didn't do that last time. Um, but I think in this next plan, we probably will go back to putting some of those things in there, some slightly more operational things. Um, not too detailed, because that's not strategic, but um, things like how do we increase youth participation right in the task forces and committees, right? And I have my intern Blaine is working on that right now. Um, so we'll, we'll and, I, and in that, in my email to the task force co-chairs, I also um, asked them for input on like anything that would help operationally. And so we'll hopefully get some more ideas, but yeah, you saw there were a few yeah. operational things in the recommendations as well. I try not to have too many processes, too much like paperwork, but we, there's some things, right? That need to be structured. And... Well, one of the crit criticisms was we were, our mission was too broad. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that we, we do need to tackle in that meeting. Um, it is a very broad mission. And it's, it's how the commission is set up legislatively, right? It's improve the status of children. And there's a definition in the statute of vulnerable youth, which is kids served by DCS, FSSA, and think about all the divisions of FSSA, right? That could mean, uh, that could mean poverty, disability, mental health, right? All of that falls under FSSA and then the juvenile justice system. So it's a broad population of kids and it's a broad mandate. Um, and so we've approached it that way and just narrowed it to those kind of four areas and the objectives to try to have some concrete focuses. But I think that's a, it's a really good question for this group. And I don't know if anyone has thoughts of, on that today or if you want to think about it and email me, you know, some ideas about could we, should we narrow our focus? Would that make it more effective? One, one idea I, I had that I want to run by this group is, you know, may, let's say, assume we keep the same four areas, which we might or might not, but if we were to keep the same four, maybe we only have two or three objectives under each one instead of five or six or seven, you know, and maybe that's a way to focus it. Um, but very, very open to ideas and suggestions on that. I mean, I think too, I mean, we have this whole youth justice committee that's coming out and these recommendations that are coming out in this report. I mean, I kind of feel like that's going to be should be like the priority and what we're looking at as far as, you know, recommendations mm -hmm. and moving forward. Yeah, that, you know, that there's, has there's gonna be a lot area. that comes out of that, I think, Yeah, you know? Yeah, so the question is, does that, then does that also need to be the focus of this group or does that kind of take care of that issue and this group can focus on other things, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I think that could go either way. Yeah. yeah. Would we ever be able to- Use the microphone. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Would we ever be able to get um, surveys like how I felt like we did this survey for like how we feel like we were doing on the commission? I think that was amazing. Will we ever be able to get surveys from the youth that we are serving? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, so I hate to start with the difficulty, but this is where my mind goes. Okay. The commission doesn't directly serve you. Okay. Right. I mean, the, the various state agencies do right, right. In, in, in different ways. Um, so I think it's possible. I think it would be 
Um, there might even already be some things on that. I'm not sure. Like what is DCS doing as far as getting input from foster youth, right? What is FSSA doing to get input from youth in their programs? I don't know, um, but we could certainly look at that. Mm -hmm. So some of us have an election that week. <laughs> so, but I guess my key thought was prevention. And I know we've done a lot of prevention and mm -hmm. uh, teen pregnancy, but just continue to focus on prevention to stopping the cycle. Yeah, thank so, you. Thank you for that input, yeah. In all areas of what we're doing. Right, moving, moving upstream yeah. in general, yeah. I last of the week would be to further investigate foster care. Mm -hmm. In what way? I, I think part of it is I worry about the youth that age out of the foster care system. Mm -hmm. And are we still treating them the best that we can and giving them the tools that they need? And mm -hmm. uh, I've kind of lost where we are in, in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll take those, those two suggestions into the, the planning process. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay, so I have a couple of implementation updates for you. As we mentioned, kind of following up on past recommendations and votes the commission has taken is, is part of our improvement process that we're working on now. So uh, a couple years ago, you all passed a recommendation to do kind of a coordinated campaign around developmental screening for young children. So I wanted to update you on that. There has been a number of conversations across both state agencies that serve young children and, uh, and private ones to, to talk about kind of aligning efforts. Um, and all the groups have kind of really coalesced around this campaign called Learn the Signs, Act Early. It's a CDC campaign um, that's aimed at parents and kind of helping them understand their, if their child is on track for milestones, they have an app or milestone tracker. And so that's something that I think is being promoted across like first steps, um, you know, different agencies that serve young children. Um, so that, that is, I think, a lot of the coordination that has gone on is around messaging and promoting that campaign. Um, and then we also have, as I think you all are aware, um, led by, the, by uh, Dr. Box in the health department, we have the IPQIC, um, Indiana Perinatal Quality Improvement Collaborative. And that group has created an infant well-being task force that has kind of taken on that charge of what else do we need to do around early developmental screening. So we've kind of pass it off to that group. And when they kind of come up with some more recommendations, we can bring them back here as well. So that, that work uh, continues. And, and just as a reminder, you know, just like Mark said about prevention, the earlier we can identify children who have delays or, or developmental disabilities, then we can intervene and the better their outcomes will be. So we need to be screening as early as possible, early and often um, for the little kids. Um, you all uh, passed a recommendation I can't, uh, I can't remember when this happened, but about posting guardianship forms. Actually, it's right there. So those guardianship forms, uh, sort of self-service forms for, let's say, this, this came, uh, Representative Summers, from your emphasis on the kinship families, the, the grandparents who are taking in the grandkids, and maybe without DCS involvement, what can we do for them? And so one of the things that we did was collaborated with IndianaLegalHelp.org and got um, forms posted there. So if it's an uncontested guardianship, grandma's got the kids and she needs to enroll them in school, she can go to that website, download the forms and file them with the court and, and take care of that guardianship. Do we know how they're doing? So this is the data that I was able to get. Um, we, and um, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to follow up on, but we know that it is the ninth most visited page on that website out of 100, more than 100 pages. So that's what they were able to give me in terms of, you know, are those forms being used and downloaded? She couldn't give me download data, but she did tell me it's the ninth most visited page. So we know that the word is getting out there that those resources are available there. Um, and then I have on here just a quote that just very coincidentally, um, when, when we were doing that work, um, I was invited to write a little piece in the Supreme Court's magazine called Court Times. And we talked about that kind of standing in the gap. And because of that article, I got an email um, from a grandparent who said, I fall exactly into that gap. Is this stuff ready? Where can I, where can I get it? School is about to start and I wanna make sure that I have you know, what I need to get my grandchild enrolled in school. So it was like right away, you know, somebody, um, somebody reached out and I was able to direct them to the resource. So that's one example, but 
Um, we know that it's out there, it's being promoted. I think DCS is also promoting it um, in those cases that they're aware of, but it's available to anyone, DCS involvement or not. The only, the only thing is, I think it's specific to cases that are uncontested, right? So it's just that they just need to get kind of the paperwork in order so they can take a kid to the doctor, take them to school, you know, do what they need to do. Um, so those forms are available. And of course, I think you all probably know this, but the other um, resource on Indiana Legal Help is it's a, there's a directory of free and low cost attorneys. So if someone actually does need an attorney, they can find um, where, where those resources are on that website. A uh, couple other updates. Uh, this group um, approved maybe about a year ago a trauma screening and assessment guide. And so this was kind of the second part of a two part effort by our trauma committee to look at ACEs. You know, everybody's kind of aware of ACEs now. And uh, what ends up happening is as soon as people learn what ACEs are and how what a huge impact they have on people's lives, they want to start asking everybody their ACE score. And that's not necessarily the best approach. So you all adopted um, a position statement on when it is and isn't appropriate to use the ACE questionnaire. And then we did this follow-up tool because and I always say this, don't, don't tell people what not to do unless you're gonna tell them what to do instead. And so um, this screening and assessment guide is a two page around, okay, if you do wanna screen for trauma, here's how you do it well, here's some things to be aware of and here's some additional tools and resources. So that tool is out there. Um, I was not able to get any um, like concrete information on who's using it. I know that we do have, sorry, I take that back. I did get some information yesterday. We have in Indiana an ACEs coalition. Um, so it's a, it's a group of people who are trained in ACEs and go out and train other communities. And that group is aware of this tool and they do um, reference it in their trainings. So I know that that is happening. I don't have any additional information on kind of who may be using it, you know, in a concrete way, but those, those ACE master trainers they're aware of it and they're using it as well as the ACEs position statement that you all adopted is on the website of that ACE coalition, Indiana ACEs coalition. Um, and then the last um, implementation update, and we're gonna keep bringing this one back, the information sharing guide. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a tool that we created that we're really, really proud of um, that we did a big update to um, about a year ago now. I think it's been a year since we published um, the update. And uh, Terry's not here, but I did want to give a thanks and a shout out to DCS. I worked with Sarah Saylors, who's the um, deputy director for Field, and she got a message out to all the family case managers um, about this tool to make sure they know about it, that, they, that it's updated. And so, and we saw that in our usage data, we got a, a spike um, last month when, when they, DCS got that email, the field staff, um, to use this tool. And so I, the question I would pose to you all and to anybody else who's watching is who else needs to know about this information sharing guide? Because it, it really is a good tool if you're working with kids at the local level to know, can I share this record? Can I request this record? Who needs to give permission, right? For this information to be shared for this child. Um, so I'll just keep reminding folks about this, this tool that's out there. Um, and if you, if you have an idea about a group of people who should know about it, whether it's like, a presentation, a training, or just an email or a newsletter blurb, let me know and we'll get the information out to them. Is this a hard copy book or is it online? Or no, it's online. There's a, it, it's, it's both a phone app, so it's a, available for iPhone and Android, and then there's also a desktop version that's linked from the Children's Commission website. So you can use it on a computer or you can download it for your phone or tablet. And in fact, I think that's what um, DCS has done is had all the family case managers like download it on their field um, iPads or whatever their their tablets that they use in the field. Um, last thing, we have dates for next year's commission meetings, um, and I will be I'll be sending out calendar invitations as usual. But I wanted to let you all know, as well as um, those folks who like to come and watch, um, we're on our typical schedule. I think these are all the third Wednesday of the month. Sometimes if there's five Wednesdays, we might go, you know, third or fourth, um, but uh, same, same typical pattern Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to noon in the even numbered months. Yes. I did look at that when I was looking at that yesterday. I thought That's, I, I, that one's pretty late. Did people turn off oh, after December the 15th? <laughs> <laughs> December the 15th, after that, it is yeah. downhill to get everybody <laughs> 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 
I'm just saying, I'm just not out. We can no, see. I mean, oh, the, the challenge is so, like, this year, December is really early. We're meeting December 7th, and that has kind of cut off some of our time to prepare things for that meeting. So it's a balance. Maybe we could go back to the second Wednesday instead of the third, but then I don't know, the Board of Education, I think, meets on second Wednesdays. So they're not going to be meeting on December 23rd. <laughs> no, they, but if we went back to the 13th, that might conflict with that group. Well, this is what we have on the calendar for now. Um, and they, and they, the uh, scheduling really is at the discretion of the chair. Next year, Senator Donato will be our chair. Um, be nice. <laughs> be nice. I'm telling like, her, girl, you know what you gotta do. She's telling me to be nice, and I'm telling her, you know what you gotta do. You gotta change. Um, so you'll get you'll get these by email, but I wanted to make sure that they were they were uh, included in the meeting today. That is what I've got for my update. Thank you so much. As always, Julie, really excellent work. Um, the, the discussion of future, you've kind of covered that, correct? Number seven. Well, unless there was anything that any commission member wanted to bring up. Do any members have any discussion that they want to add to all the information we've received today? So if I wanted to present at- Microphone. Microphone. <laughs> if all can hear me? If I wanted to present at the next meeting, how would I go about doing that? So you would talk to me and I would, I would uh, put you on the draft agenda and then that would go through the executive committee. So the executive committee um, approves the agendas for each okay. meeting. So let's talk. Okay. Thank you. Julie, we cannot come back in this room. <laughs> we, can you get the chamber or, I mean, it, we'll help you, yeah. but the, this room is, I can't hear. I we could, we could try to move to government center. Actually, I looked at government center for December because it's also easier for the AV folks. Oh, the governor's Ted's office yeah. is over there. I think for our December date, all those big meeting rooms are already booked, but for next year, we can look at going back to government center. Yes, we need to. Either mm -hmm. that or either the I'm chamber sure they the can thing. hear well. But we, can't, but we hear. can't hear them. And yeah. I'm, I'm literally leaning over trying to read their lips. Well, okay. You have such a soft voice. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that, Gail. The House Committee rooms. <laughs> No, I, I can, if you want me to check with your LA, we can do that. It's big enough because we don't have that. Right. Yeah. I, think it's, I think it's big enough. Yeah, please check 156. Okay. We would do about anything to not get back out of in here. here. Okay. We just know okay. we can't hear. Good to know. Besides, they've been trying to get her library card back from her. For <laughs> <laughs> they know I can't read. <laughs> they know I can't. Look, there is no other comments. I need a motion to adjourn. Good meeting. Good meeting. Are we adjourned? Adjourned. Are we adjourned? Are we adjourned, yes. Yes. Senator Donato? Yes, ma'am. Are we adjourned? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, they're so cute. Okay, so.